was oh, on. Aretha that Franklin's just... performance at the Kennedy Insane. Center back in 2015. You got to watch it. Uh, her classic rendition of uh, Carol King's You Make Me Feel Like a Natural Woman, bringing then President Barack Obama to tears. The mink drop. <laughs> it was amazing. Amazing. That iconic moment is one of the oh many that Pulitzer Prize winning author David Remnick writes about in his new book entitled Holding the Note profiles in popular music. In it, he highlights several of the greatest musicians, songwriters, and performers of the past 50 years, profiling them late in their career. Yet, he writes, there was never any diminishment in the desire to make music, to hold the note. And David joins us now. He is, of course, editor of The New Yorker. David, thank you so much for being with us. I love what, what, what you wrote about That's Aretha cold. Franklin. There's <laughs> so much, so much that you could say about this extraordinary woman, this extraordinary singer and artist. But you say the thing that stands out the most about her was her musical intelligence. Explain. Oh, well, you even hear it there. This is late in her career at the Kennedy Center. And, you know, this is a gospel singer singing on a pop stage at a ki kind of ceremonial thing that happens once a year that has usually has kind of show busy Las vegas -y performances. And Aretha just came out and I, it, it, she just burned it down. Yeah. She burned it down. Yeah. And she was not a well woman at that stage in her life either. <sighs> And she, you know, she brought out the mink coat, and you notice that she drops it. This is the <laughs> oldest grand gospel move in the world. Mahalia Jackson would do that. And it was news to some people, but I, I, it, I, your life just got 10% better when you watched that. And Mika, our good yeah. friend Carol King speaks for all of us in that clip. <laughs> She's just going berserk, <laughs> drinking it in. It's fantastic. <laughs> Well, imagine she wrote that song with her husband on a just to write a hit, and they did it overnight practically. And then many years later, to hear it embodied like that, mm. it must be un Beautiful. incredibly Lord. thrilling. Yeah, just unbelievable. David, you write uh, in the book. You write in part in July of 2008 when Billy Joel closed Shea Stadium as the final rock act before the place came under the wrecking ball. He invited Paul McCartney to join him mm. and perform. I saw her standing there. Shea Stadium is, after all, where Beatlemania reached its apogee in the 60s. Joel ceded his piano to McCartney. I asked him if he minded playing second fiddle to his guest. I am second fiddle, he said. Everyone is second fiddle to <laughs> Paul McCartney. Songs are emotionally charged and brief, so we remember them whole. The melody, the hook, the lyrics, where we, where we were, what we felt. My father, an exceedingly quiet man, found his deepest connection with me through music. We watched Beatlemania take shape on television. My father did not fail to mention that all the hysteria reminded him of a skinny Italian-American singer from Hoboken. But this, he admitted, was much bigger. Some years later, I began to see how music and the stories of musicians could play an uncanny role in our lives. And, and what a role it's played in your life. And you speak of Paul McCartney, you're right. I mean, McCartney has spent the past 50 years or so uh, with everybody else playing second, third, fourth fiddle to him. Just extraordinary. <laughs> and you hear his songs and you know that 300 years from now, somebody's going to be singing Yesterday or Mull of Kentai or on whatever <laughs> musical instrument. Uh, they're they're playing, um, but you had an extraordinary opportunity to to wow. be with McCartney up close uh, and actually sit and watch the screening of Peter Jackson's extraordinary uh, redo uh, for for Get Back. Well, the book is is profiles of people in in, in late career, people who were big when I was a kid: Paul McCartney, Leonard right. Cohen. Bob Dylan, Springsteen, Aretha, and all the rest. And it was very moving to me. You know, I was interviewing Paul McCartney. He plopped down on the couch and out pops a hearing aid. And he was a little abashed by this, but he's been standing in front of gigantic right. amplifiers since he's 15 years old. It's only natural. Everybody else needs a hearing aid. Why shouldn't it be him? <laughs> and he now, at the age of 80, 81, whatever he is, he loves being Paul McCartney. I saw him at MetLife Stadium at, in Jersey uh, last summer. 
It was. And, it, you know, it's, it's a weird thing. He's 80 years old. He's playing pop music that he's been playing since he's a kid. And you think, why not? You know, rock and roll didn't start out to be something for anybody. There was teenage music. It was the music of, you know, backseats of cars and love and all that growing up. And it's, it's an art form that's lasted longer than anybody had any reason to believe. Uh, and here he is playing Little Richard on a stage at the age mm -hmm. of 80. There's something uh, melancholy about it, bittersweet about it, and absolutely thrilling because he's still alive. It's interesting to hear you say that. I'm a huge yeah. Rolling Stones fan as well. And every time I go, you go to it, you go, is yeah. it going to be? And then yeah. you, Mick is in great shape. And yeah, he's 80, but he's sprinting across and the stage. Comical. And it's, it's a little works. comical, too. You know, act, the whole process, the business of acting cool <laughs> after a certain age is a little <laughs> a strain. They pull know? it off somehow, though. You know, I saw about a month ago, I went and saw Bruce in, in, in Newark. Right. In New Jersey, which is a religious experience for mm -hmm. someone from New Jersey, but what Tell is it? About what it. is it about these? That's a conversation for another day. But what is it about talking to these incredible icons at later stages in their life, later stages in their career, when they've already been through it all and they're kind of on the other side of it? But, what and, is it about and, that that fascinates you? And Springsteen you? especially is very conscious of this. There's so, look, most bands last as they live as long as mayflies. They come, they go. Um, they have, maybe if they're lucky, they have a moment, and then that's it. Or, or like the Stones, they have a, an extended moment, and then they keep playing those songs for the most part, and when they play something new, you go out and get a beer. I mean, if we're being honest, it's an amazing band. Springsteen is something else. He's, he, you, you may think, you know, his very hottest moment is at, at a certain time in the 70s, but he's now writing the songs of an older man. He, right now he's on tour, and if you look at that set list, it's about getting older, mm -hmm. it's about facing death, it's about friends who are yes. uh, leaving this life, and that's what life is about too. It's just that it's in a pop idiom, a soul idiom, that you thought was restricted to you know, younger themes. And it turns out it's a much more malleable thing in the hands of a genius like Springsteen or Dylan or whoever you yes. talked about. I saw it on the same tour, was really struck by the how mortality hovers over it, even, sure. as, even as much as if it's a party too. So you mentioned Bob Dylan, I wanted to ask about that. Someone yeah. whose career has so remarkably changed a few different times. Talk to us about how you explored that evolution. Well, I, I think if I have to point to a singular, a singular genius of, 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 of in, at least from in my uh, view, it's Dylan. And part of it is that, you know, when he had his motorcycle accident in the mid 60s, he was, you know, only in his mid 20s. And he had already written songs that would last for, you know, forever, forever. And a lot of them. Since that time, he's gone through so many iterations that songs used to come to him like rain. They just would fall on him. He can't hold out the bucket in some way. And they were there. As he, as he got older, he had to work for them harder. Um, and he, you know, there were moments that were down. You know, the, the, the late 80s were not a per peak period for Bob Dylan. But right now, he's on tour, the never-ending tour, in his, in his early 80s. And he's playing almost all new songs. Yeah. Almost all new songs. Elegiac. Uh, death soaked uh, all about the c popular culture of America, the political culture of America. He has new things to say in old idioms, you know, it, whether it's hillbilly music or the blues or uh, this guy, I, I just somehow think he's the most overwritten about person at the same time. It, you, you can't get to the bottom of him. Mm. I think he's in a, a phenomenon. Uh, David, uh, I'd like to go back to Aretha for a minute, if, if we could, because um, it, you mentioned something when, when she died. The column I wrote was about her musical intelligence, about yeah. what uh, what just a, a smart, a brilliant musician she was and how she combined that. Of course, she was a gospel singer and she had soul and she had the pipes and she had everything. But she was she was analytical and purposeful about everything that she did. Could you talk about that? And also, are there 
you know, the others you wrote about um, are, are, are others of these legends, uh, technical and, and accomplished at music in that same way. They're, they're radically different. I mean, you know, Leonard Cohen was somebody, I, I don't think I've ever interviewed an author of any kind <laughs> who's more eloquent than Leonard Cohen was on his deathbed. That's when I saw him. I saw him in the last weeks of his life in, in his little, little, very small house in, in, in downtown L.A., um, Aretha, is, when I encountered her, again, she was, she was ill, although holding back the news of that. Um, she, she was suspicious of the world, like Chuck Berry and many other black performers who got ripped off early in their careers. They were, she was very wary uh, of where the money was going and who was or was not exploiting her and all the rest. Once she was on stage, her level of self-possession, where she places the beat, how she creates and constructs a song. You saw that th thing at the Kennedy Center, even late in her career. The way that three-minute thing is, is emotionally constructed and how she embodies it has such emotional force that it brings you to your knees. And you, you saw there, you know, uh, Carol King almost jumping over the balcony. I thought she was going to end up in the, <laughs> <laughs> in the seats below. Um, and, and she, in the studio, working with Jerry Wexler and, and other musicians, knew exactly what she wanted, even as, as a young woman, despite how chaotic her personal life was, uh, the life around her was, uh, uh, you know, from childhood on, uh, on the road. She had a complicated family, to say the least. Um, she grew up in a, in a politically turbulent time, and she was in the middle of those things and cared about those things. Uh, these are extraordinary American lives. Thank you.